men are Freemasons, members of a worldwide fraternity which unites working men in small towns with men of rank and opulence occupying the highest seats of power. Once public Masonic parades were commonplace, but this annual march by the Masons of Melrose in Scotland is probably the last in Britain. The march honors the stonemasons who built Melrose Abbey and gives local Freemasons a chance to parade their new lodge master around the town. But Britain's other 9,000 lodges meet behind closed doors and the identity of most of Britain's half a million Masons is a closely guarded secret. It's estimated that of 135,000 serving policemen in Britain, 22,000, or one in six, are Freemasons. Most Masons say there is no conflict of interest between police work and membership of the Brotherhood, but some outsiders disagree. What is certain, and I've seen the evidence for it and other people have seen it, that there are lists of lodges which include active criminals and serving policemen in the same lodge, and that can never be right. Critics also worry that Masons are concentrated in many other powerful institutions, notably the law. Confidential Masonic documents reveal that hundreds of magistrates, at least 18 circuit judges, four Queen's Bench judges, three family division judges, two judges in chancery, three Lord Justices of Appeal, and one Lord of Appeal are Masons. But it's in the city of London that the greatest concentration of Masons is found. For Britain's richest square mile, there are hundreds of Masonic lodges in which brothers from the great banks and insurance houses the stock exchange and all the other money markets meet in secret. Here at the Guild Hall, from which the city is governed, Masons gather in the crypt for a meeting of the Guild Hall Lodge. A past lodge master, Sir Kenneth Cork, is handed the briefcase containing his ceremonial apron by his chauffeur. The head of one of the city's most successful accountancy firms, specializing in company liquidations and bankruptcies, Sir Kenneth is also a former Lord Mayor of London. Since 1900, 70 London Lord Mayors have been masters of Guildhall Lodge, evidence of the high esteem in which Masons are held in Britain's traditional institutions. But have other Masons used the Brotherhood for corrupt ends, as even some Masons claim? I think that people uh, use Freemasonry or, or for the wrong purposes. They use it as a way to get on, to improve their position, to get promotion. And uh, corrupt people uh, use, that, use it to um, carry out their corrupt, corruption in a, in a secret manner, with very little chance of being caught. Brother Junior Warden, there is a report. Tonight, in the first of six programmes on the Brotherhood's power and influence, we investigate the secret ceremonial rituals of the ancient fraternity of free and accepted Masons and show how its members have ranged from the highest to the lowest in British society, from kings to convicts. Whom have you there? Mr. Martin, a poor candidate in a state of darkness. Filming well the mysteries of Freemasonry is forbidden, so Using Masonic handbooks and helped by Master Masons, we have reconstructed the Brotherhood's rituals. Tonight, thousands of men all over Britain are performing these mystic rites. Worshipful Master, Mr. Martin, a poor candidate in a state of darkness who has been well and worthily recommended... There are three degrees of initiation into basic craft Freemasonry. This is the first degree ritual in which the candidate seeks to become an apprentice Mason. Do you... Brother Inner Guard vouch that he has been properly prepared. I do, Worshipful Master. Then let him be admitted in due form. Brother Deacons. Do you feel anything? Yes. Women are not allowed to become Masons, and some interpretations of the ritual say the candidate's left breast is exposed to prove that he is not a woman. His trouser leg is rolled up to show that he's able-bodied and he is blindfolded because he is in a state of darkness seeking light. To non-Masons, these rituals might seem a strange pastime for grown men to indulge in. 
But psychologist Jane Furbank, who studied male bonding, believes that Freemasonry may satisfy a deeper need than other all-male groups. Thus assured, I will thank you to kneel while the blessing of heaven is invoked on our proceedings. On the purely practical level, it has the same need as joining the local chamber of commerce, the golf club and all the rest. Um, but it does also give you what's called a rite of passage. It takes you in from being adolescent or from being what's technically called a peripheral male, one on the outside. Brings you into the centre, into the heart, where the power and the influence is. That power and influence knows few bounds. The Palace of Westminster houses one of English masonry's best-kept secrets, the existence of two lodges reserved for men who work in Parliament. One of these, the Gallery Lodge, was founded 100 years ago by pressmen and lobby correspondents. The other was created at the suggestion of the Prince of Wales, later King Edward VIII, an ardent mason. In the 1920s, he was upset to learn Labour politicians were being blackballed when proposed as members of Masonic lodges. The craft stood to be condemned as the Tory party in aprons, and when Labour looked set to become the party of government, masonry was in danger of losing all influence over Britain's future. The Prince suggested a new lodge to welcome Labour MPs, and so draw them into both masonry and the middle ground of British politics. The aptly named New Welcome Lodge was consecrated in 1929, and today it contains 20 past and present MPs from all leading parties. Yet it must tread a careful path if it's not to break one of the Brotherhood's loudly proclaimed rules. Your obedience must be proved by a strict observance of our laws and regulations, by abstaining from every topic of political and religious discussion. Despite this injunction against discussing politics within the Lodge, there is no rule against Masons interfering in politics outside the Lodge. In 1935, Masons played a crucial role in the election of a new leader of the Labour Party. Clement Attlee and one of his rivals for the leadership, Arthur Greenwood, were Masons. But a third candidate, Herbert Morrison, was not. In an interview filmed in 1965, but not broadcast, Morrison reflects on Freemasonry's damaging effect on his career. Somebody, who I do not know, uh, anonymously, sent me a copy of a notice convening a Freemason's Lodge meeting. A few days, anything up to a week, I forget the exact lapse of time, um, before this meeting of the Parliamentary Party to decide upon the leadership. Then the anonymous writer suggested that the meeting of the Freemasons' Lodge was to win support for Mr. Arthur Greenwood, who was known to be a Freedom Mason and, in fact, was a very important officer of this lodge. Yet as Freemason Robert Burns perhaps meant to say, even the best laid plans of Mason men can fail. Greenwood came third in the first ballot and was eliminated. In the runoff, the Masons switched their vote to Brother Attlee. This ensured the defeat of the non-Mason Morrison. So despite Freemasonry's claim never to interfere in politics, it seems the Brotherhood had a direct influence on one of the most important British political decisions this century. Shows that the country is ready. Worshipful Brother Attlee went on to become Prime Minister in 1945 and stayed Labour leader until 1955. Today, British Masons still occupy positions of political power. At least two cabinet ministers are members of the Brotherhood. Cecil Parkinson belongs to the Royal Athelstan Lodge and the Potter's Bar Lodge, which meets in his constituency. And Lord Belstead belongs to the exclusive Kaiser Ehind Lodge. He became leader of the House of Lords in 1988, succeeding another Mason, Viscount Whitelaw, who had been Mrs. Thatcher's deputy prime minister. Former Health Minister Sir Gerard Vaughan and backbencher Neil Thorne are both grand officers of English Freemasonry. Many other MPs are Masons, including Cecil Walker, Ulster Unionist, Sir William Clark, Anthony Nelson, Peter Rost, Tony Baldry, David Sumberg and Gary Waller, all Conservatives. Another Mason is the former MP and Solicitor General Sir Ian Percival, who says it's inconceivable that Masons would interfere in politics. If anybody tries it, 
not only would they not succeed, uh, but they wouldn't get as much as they would have got without doing it, if you know what I mean. I mean, they would be blacklisted. Uh, and not only by the rest of the house, they'd be blacklisted by the masons in the house, because we don't want that reputation. And if anybody tries it, I can tell you, we're very stern about it. But some non-Mason MPs remain uneasy about the existence of a parliamentary lodge. It's uh, bringing together a subgroup within the House for various covert purposes from which the rest of us are excluded. Therefore, uh, in a, a representative institution, it must, if so facto, be undesirable. Freemasons Hall, London, headquarters of the English craft. One man in every 30 in England and Wales is a Mason. In Scotland and Northern Ireland, the ratio is even higher. Their leaders always come from the top of the social pyramid. This century, three kings have been Masons. The Queen's father, George VI, was in the Navy Lodge. So was Prince Philip, but he quit many years ago. Today, England's chief Mason is the Queen's cousin, the worshipful Grand Master, the Duke of Kent. I think it is probably true that many of the problems, if I can call them that, that Freemasonry has encountered in do stem from uh, perhaps a misguided policy towards information. As part of a new policy of openness, England's other Masonic bosses were filmed for the first time in 1988. The pro Grand Master is Lord Cornwallis, third Baron of Linton, a farmer and businessman. The assistant Grand Master is Lord Farnham, a merchant banker. And the deputy Grand Master is the Honourable Edward Bailew, a retired stockbroker. Although many Masons are from what used to be called the working class, most are from the middle and upper classes. Professional men, lawyers, doctors, army officers, bank managers, and self-employed businessmen. Show business personalities like Alfred Marx, Mike Reed, and Bob Monkhouse are also on the square. All these men have been put through the ritual humiliation inflicted at each of the Brotherhood's first three degrees. They are therefore sworn to uphold three principles, brotherhood, relief or charity, and truth. But alongside these worthy principles, the brotherhood has many disquieting features. Its membership is largely secret. The brothers have secret ways of making themselves known to each other, and they have sworn secret oaths of mutual aid. These are all hallmarks of a secret society. Yet English Masonry's Grand Secretary, Michael Hyam, rejects any sinister interpretation of the Order's secrecy. We've got secrets. Secrets which derive from the old days when they were recognition signals between craftsmen protecting their trade secrets, and we still use them now as, as a link with the past. But we're absolutely not a secret society. Nevertheless, among the public, the fear persists that there may be more to the secrets than harmless ritual. And when cameras were invited to film in Grand Lodge for the first time, not everything would be open for scrutiny. Journalist Paul Foote has long campaigned against what he sees as Freemasonry's sinister power. It's the secrecy of the association and the bonds that they tie each other up with, which is the sinister aspect of it. Most of the other organizations which uh, bring together important people in the community, I mean the Rotary Club or the Round Table or organizations of like, like that, they can be discovered, if you like, by someone like me or you. We can go and find out who's the chairman of the round table or who's the chairman of the Rotary Club, and they throw their meetings open to the public and uh, the press mingle with them and so on. Uh, Freemasonry, they mingle in secret. Are you therefore willing to take a solemn obligation founded on the principles I have stated to keep inviolate the secrets and mysteries of the order? I am. I am. Then you will kneel on your left knee. Your right foot formed in a square. Give me your right hand, which I place on the volume of the sacred law, while your left will support these compasses, one point presented to your naked left breast. 
The impressionable apprentice Freemason undergoes a bizarre and powerful bonding. Nevertheless, many senior Masons dismiss concern about secret Masonic influence as an orchestrated campaign against the Brotherhood. I think there is a small body of people who, for reasons that I don't understand, are not in the, not friendly, they are downright hostile. And uh, the activists usually are the ones whose views get heard most, and they've been making quite a noise. In 1988, in an attempt to confront growing public suspicion, the Freemasons produced a glossy video. The spire of Salisbury Cathedral, 250 feet of soaring stone, rising above the water meadows of the Wiltshire Avon. The traveling stonemasons who built the great cathedrals of medieval Europe formed their own associations, apart from the rest of the medieval guild system. For all its apparent openness, the commercially produced video is a careful exercise in concealment. Even the legend that modern Freemasons are descended from medieval stoneworkers is left virtually intact. But there is little historical evidence for this, as Masonic historian John Hamill confirms. When people were first starting to put Masonic histories together, the tradition grew up that we grew directly out of the stonemasons, and I mean, traditions die very hard, particularly in this country. And it's taken a lot of time to break that down and say, well, look, that's fine, it's a nice story, but is the evidence there for it? Most evidence indicates that ritualistic Freemasonry was started much later, in 17th century Britain, not by stonemasons, but by middle-class gentlemen. The movement soon caught on. It was a period of great religious and political turmoil when differences of opinion on religion and politics not only split families but led to the civil war in this country and to bloodshed and brother fighting brother. And we believe that the people who started Freemasonry were a group of people who wanted to have some sort of forum where they could meet without the differences of religion and politics coming into it. The dangers you have escaped are those of stabbing and strangling. For on your entrance to the lodge, this poniard was presented to your naked left breast to imply that had you rashly attempted to rush forward, you would have been accessory to your own death by stabbing. While the brother who the blood-curdling rituals of Freemasonry today were invented in the early 18th century. At that time of religious and political persecution, a fearsome oath of secrecy may have seemed essential. But can the same be true today? Equally fatal. But the danger which traditionally would have awaited you until your latest hour, was the physical penalty at one time associated with the obligation of a mason, that of having your throat cut across had you improperly disclosed the secrets of masonry. According to their own video, today's masons steadfastly keep the secrets of the rituals for innocent, if masochistic, reasons. You lose all the mystique, I think, if, if you knew what was going through. The, the, you know, the fear, for example, uh, if I knew what was going to happen, I don't think I'd have got the same pleasure. Earlier this century, hundreds of Protestant clergy were Masons. The craft was an unquestioned pillar of society, and bishops, even archbishops, felt its rituals supported religion. But growing unease provoked a Church of England inquiry, which reported in 1986 that elements of Freemasonry are incompatible with Christianity, even blasphemous. Today, many Anglican priests share the Catholic view that Masonry's offer of spiritual light is not just unacceptable, they think it's a satanic fraud. Well-meaning people, good, honest, upright people, are being deceived. And the Bible teaches us that there's one source of uh, the deceiver who is, who is described as the devil, Satan. And I think underneath it all, it is um, a deception. It purports to be light, but is in fact darkness. Freemasonry stresses it is not a religion, only that its members must be male, over 21, and believe in a god, any god. Freemasons of different faiths pray together to a supreme being, who is referred to as the great architect of the universe. We asked Jane Furbank, as a psychologist and a woman, for her thoughts on the great architect. Well, this is obviously a biased point of view, but he sounds to me rather a masculine sort of god, there seems to be very little talk about um, the more spiritual side or what you might describe as the more feminine side of religion. There's no Freemason equivalent of the Virgin Mary, for example. Um, this God requires you to stand up straight.
to make certain very precise gestures, you know, um, to talk a great deal about being straight and level and square. Not round, you notice, but square. If you look at the psychology of symbols, you'll find roundness is the mind, the spirit, it's wholeness. And squareness is much more order, material, physical world. Do men continue to join Freemasonry in the face of suspicion, even outright condemnation? It's difficult for outsiders not to think that self-interest and career considerations must play a part. Certainly the view persists that the code of mutual aid in the ritual can lead to brother masons combining to the detriment of non-masons. Those Masonic bonds of preferment seem to apply in unlikely places. Ex-Detective Sergeant John Simons was a Freemason when he was in the Metropolitan Police. Later he went to prison, convicted of soliciting a bribe. Freemasonry is rife in prison. I, must say, I, I spent some time in an open prison where um, I witnessed, uh, you know, contacts between Masonic prisoners and Masonic prison warders and Masonic prisoners were getting special visits and having parcels left by the gate and all this sort of business. But Masonic prisoners may enjoy more than special privileges. Informal lodge meetings are held in Britain's jails, as one bemused inmate discovered. I go to the meeting and there, there is the chap uh, two ch a chaplain and a deputy a vicar from outside two prison officers, two or three prison officers, and maybe half a dozen prisoners. T. Dan Smith, one time boss of Newcastle City Council, had been sentenced to six years jail in 1976 for corruption. He was not a Freemason. I just didn't know what the hell I'd put myself into. And within minutes, they, I mean, obviously, they knew that I didn't know what I was doing there, and that I wasn't a Mason. And consequently, there were considerable annoyance. The chaplain of all people said, oh, you know, this is outrageous. What, oh, you know, how wide and earth. And of course, I was out in two seconds flat. But by then, of course, I knew what the score was. Contrary to many Masons' belief, nothing in their vows forbids them telling outsiders that they are Masons. Yet as long as most refuse to admit membership, they will encounter suspicion that they use Masonry to combine clandestinely and to scratch each other's backs. I don't mind mutual sustenance, and certainly uh, I positively like uh, uh, charitable organizations which provide a service, uh, and many of the lodges, much of Freemasonry does that and concentrates on that. It's, it's when it becomes something more than that, not only a means of serving the community, but of serving themselves, uh, that uh, it, becomes, uh, it becomes worrying. This concern about the Brotherhood has recently been reflected nationwide. In the last five years, in response to local allegations of Masonic skullduggery, councils from Liverpool and Manchester to Worthing and South End have expressed grave misgivings about Freemasonry. Questions have been asked in Parliament, and police committees up and down the country have debated Masonic influence within the police force. OK, I'd like to welcome everybody to this meeting of the Islington Police Community Consultative Group. During the next five weeks, this series will investigate public concern about the Brotherhood. Freemasons claim to occupy higher moral ground than non-Masonic outsiders. But a constant flow of allegations suggests that Freemasonry may be a perfect vehicle for corruption. Corruption in law enforcement, in local government, and in business. Overseas, it has even been used to subvert democracy. Next week, we investigate the unacceptable convergence of Freemasonry and corruption in Britain's police forces. Master, true to his obligation, answered that those secrets were known to but three in the world, and that without the consent and cooperation of the other two, he neither could 
nor would divulge them. This is Freemasonry's third degree ceremony, when the candidate becomes a master mason. It reenacts the murder of Hiram Abiff, the mythical architect of Solomon's temple. Half a million men in Britain today, including some 22,000 police, have been through this ritual climax. The ruffian aimed a violent blow at the head of our master, but being startled by the firmness of his demeanor, it missed his forehead and only glanced on his right temple, and with such force that it caused him to reel and sink down on his left knee. Covering from the, shock, the mystique and the, the power of a ritual like this can certainly sway some people who would perhaps rather not think for themselves, or who would do anything rather than give up that feeling of support and backing and strength that they get from the group. And those are the people who will say, I was following orders. You know, I couldn't betray my mates, even though whatever it was was patently wrong. Nowhere is the pressure to stand by your mates stronger than in the police, where generations of detectives have used Freemasonry as a cover for corruption. Tonight, we reveal the hidden Masonic connections in some of Britain's biggest police corruption scandals and the Scotland Yard network, which one Masonic detective branded a firm in a firm. In 1987, Detective Alan Holmes, a Freemason who had joined the craft while serving at Croydon Police Station, faced the ultimate test of his Masonic loyalty. Holmes was not corrupt, but was under great pressure to betray a Masonic colleague. Scotland Yard's anti-corruption squad, CIB2, believed he knew of crooked links between a Masonic detective commander, Freemason Kenneth Noy, convicted of receiving part of the £26 million worth of gold stolen in Britain's biggest ever robbery the 1983 Brinksmack job. Unknown to Holmes, CIB2 arranged for him to be secretly recorded as he gossiped to a fellow detective in his lodge. When Holmes was told he had unknowingly shopped his brother Masons, he became deeply distressed. One morning, in his back garden, he shot and killed himself. Former Detective Sergeant John Simons worked with Holmes in the 1960s. I knew Tuppy Holmes very well. Um, he was uh, he was my right-hand man, really, for, for some time. Whenever I was on night duty CID, I always took Taffy along with me as my uh, assistant and companion. He was a strong man. Uh, very good man, strong, honest. Uh, no fear in him whatsoever. At the time of his death, Taffy Holmes was the master of Manor of Bencham Lodge, which had at least five serving or retired policemen among its members. The conflict between Holmes's loyalty to masonry and the police was too much for him. His fellow masons from Croydon Masonic Hall sent symbolic wreaths to his funeral. One was inscribed, To our brave, wonderful and worshipful master who chose death rather than dishonor his friends and workmates. Some of his lodge brothers clearly thought that Taffy Holmes, like Hiram Abiff, had died rather than betray Masonic secrets. Our master remained firm and unshaken. When the villain was armed with a heavy maul, struck him a violent blow on the forehead, which laid him lifeless at his feet. Freemasonry and police corruption have been bedfellows for decades. Many allegations involve outsiders using Masonic bonds to persuade policemen to drop prosecutions for offences like careless driving. Former Inspector Brian Hilliard, now the editor of Police Review, is a non-Mason. He recalls an incident from his own career. The sergeant said to me, I was in a certain place last night, and Mr. Brown, who I believe you're going to prosecute me, approached me and wondered if you have to go forward with the prosecution. I said, well, you know, it will depend entirely on what the witnesses say. Uh, he was prosecuted. He saw me before court. He says, does this have to, have to happen? I said, it depends on witnesses. He was fined, and as he came out of court, he shook his head very sadly. He said, I don't know how we can do this to one another. Now, I know absolutely that he was a mason and thought I was a mason. Many police who are not in the Brotherhood are concerned about its influence. But Masonic policemen see no conflict between the job and the craft. Every police officer, the day he walks into whatever, whichever training establishment, takes an oath 
to her sovereign lady, the Queen, to, to serve her in the office of constable without fear or favor. And that is paramount. Whatever else you do in your life, whatever else you become, whether you're a Boy Scout, a Freemason, or you join the local golf club, it matters not. It is your obligation as a constable that is paramount. One of the dangers and one of the wrong things about Freemasonry in, in the, in the, within the police force is that you have here a group of people who have loyalties um, which are stronger and, uh, and um, more important to them uh, than their loyalties uh, 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 to, to the police force and to the public uh, as their oath. But why do so many young policemen become Freemasons? There's certainly a feeling that if you are a Mason, you better your chances of promotion or you better your chances of uh, being selected for in London for the CID. This was exactly the experience of John Simons. Having become a Mason in the army, he joined the Metropolitan Police in 1960. When he wanted to join the elite CID, he found his masonry came in very handy. But there was another vital qualification for young police anxious to become detectives. You either had to be corrupt or you had to condone corruption. You were tested in a way, you know. Um, they didn't want to bring into the CID people who were going to be horrified at my corruption and were going to make waves and complain about it or and whatnot. And you were really tested. You were uh, not only uh, corruption in as much as that you would be prepared to accept money um, or perhaps if you weren't prepared to accept money, you, would, you, you wouldn't make a fuss about other things. You would condone it. When Simons joined CID, a dangerous tradition prevailed at Scotland Yard. To keep the lid on serious crime, some senior officers took payoffs from major criminals and let them run the rackets. They gave them licenses. They used them as a sort of police force, in a way, to patrol and control the areas that they operated in. Now, that relationship was itself corrupt, um, but it was also oiled by money, which gave it another degree of corruption. It was a pretty nasty pot. In 1969, the Times newspaper was contacted by a small-time criminal claiming to be fed up with detectives extorting money from him. Reporters tape-recorded his next encounters with detectives, one of whom explained how the criminal could buy immunity to commit crime all over London. And the phrase that he used, that the officer used, was, I'm a member of a little firm within a firm. The implications of that that there was a secret society, uh, a tight-knit group of police officers who dealt amongst themselves and who could guarantee immunity for criminals around the whole of the metropolitan area. That phrase gave a, a depth and a ring to what was to become a major corruption scandal. The officer who talked of the firm in a firm was Freemason John Simons. When the story was published, he was charged with soliciting a 50-pound bribe and suspended. While not denying his part in the corruption of the time, he claims the actual charge was absurd. Faced with what he saw as a fit-up, he sent word to the officers probing the allegations that if jailed, he would expose many other corrupt detectives. The chief investigator was a Freemason, Superintendent Bill Moody, then head of London's obscene publication squad. I sent a message to Moody through another Freemason saying that um, I, I, I wouldn't stand for the, the fit-up. I knew what was going on. And uh, unless he stopped doing what he was doing, I intended to expose everything that I knew about Metropolitan Police, corruption, Freemasonry, this involvement in corruption, himself and uh, the um, porn, porn squad, which I knew, I knew about. In threatening to expose his brother Masons, Simons was only too aware of the traditional punishment awaiting Masonic traitors, being cut in half. The penal sign is given by drawing the hand smartly across the body. The threat is perhaps symbolic, but according to Simons, the reality is just as bad. This is it's much more dangerous to receive a Masonic threat. It's not the sort of what the injuries to be inflicted. It means that a group of people who, who have power have this tremendous animosity towards you, a group animosity, if you like. And uh, the threat is that, that uh, certain bad things will, will befall you. The full penalty was that of having been severed in two, the bowels burnt to ashes, the 
Simon's resolved to fight fire with fire. He gave a solicitor a dossier listing the crimes of fellow detectives to be published if anything happened to him. Some colleagues then offered Simons a deal, which he now discloses for the first time. I was more or less escorted out of the country. I received advice and money from, um, uh, from my colleagues. What kind of money? How much money? <clears throat> well, I, I received £2,000, which uh, in those days was an awful lot of money. Um, Where did this money come from? It came from uh, um, Superintendent Moody originally, but I'm not saying he supplied it all, but um, it was, you know, and, and various other um, colleagues of his. Simons fled abroad. When he returned seven years later, he received a two-year jail term. Ironically, by then, the very man who'd been investigating him was himself doing 12 years. Bill Moody had been jailed in 1977, along with Commander Ken Drury of the Flying Squad. These two Masons had both been taking colossal bribes from pornographers. The Porn Squad trials lifted the veil on a hidden world in which Masonic police were mixing with Masonic crooks in the secrecy of Masonic lodges. But honest Masons argue it is to the Brotherhood's credit that several witnesses for the Crown were also on the square. Some of the people who brought them to justice were in fact Freemasons, but primarily they were good investigative police officers. And they were not, they did not depart from their, the true course of their duty. They pursued it with a rigor which it certainly deserved and which is fully merited. Back in 1877, exactly 100 years before the Pawn Squad trials, bribery and corruption had become so endemic in Scotland Yard's detective department that complete reorganization was necessary. Even then, masonry had played a dominant role. So although there are many honest Masonic policemen, Freemasonry and police corruption have always been hand in glove. For uh, a young officer to join the Masons, uh, there have got to be some question marks. I mean, why do men of 25, 26 want to join a fairly old-fashioned organization which has uh, a fuddy-duddy image, um, a fairly serious image? They must see something in it for themselves. Yet there is a more charitable explanation for why policemen join Freemasonry, one which reflects the difficulties they face when seeking friendships outside the job. Serving as a police officer, one is uh, fairly restricted into the uh, social contact that you have. You're uh, constrained with the people that you meet outside of the police service who uh, may be a, a dishonest uh, character. And Freemasonry, as I saw it, was an opportunity for me to enjoy a social life outside the police service whereby you met uh, honest and true people because that's really um, the, the claim of Freemasonry to be just and upright true uh, members of society. John Simmons had been a Mason for 15 years when in 1978 he moved from Scotland Yard to take charge of the CID in the City of London Police, the force which polices London's historic square mile. Corruption had been rife among city detectives for decades. In May 1978, a security guard was shot dead as he delivered £200,000 in wages to the Daily Mirror. It was the third violent robbery to hit the city in 18 months, netting the robbers £640,000. Each was carried out with an ease, indicating the gangsters had been working with corrupt police. Simmons started his new job the day after the Mirror robbery. Already suspicious of some of the detectives now under his command, he decided not to reveal that he himself was a Mason. I knew that the principals involved in it were Freemasons, and I didn't want to go in there uh, with any uh, chance of being caught up with them. I just wanted to avoid uh, anybody knowing I wanted to do my job as it should be done. And uh, when officers uh, first met me, uh, all the usual signs, uh, language and uh, contact were made uh, to try and identify whether I was a Freemason. Simmons didn't respond to these Masonic approaches, but his ploy came unstuck when an ambitious and talented detective chief inspector named Phil Cuthbert met an old friend of Simmons at a Masonic function. Cuthbert, um, Vesci come running into my office the next day and uh, as we said, you've been telling Porky's got me, you know, and I said, well, um, What's up, Phil? And he said, you're on the square. And then he mentioned the guy's name. And I either had to make him appear a liar, and I said, OK, Phil, 
Um, I am a Freemason, um, but it doesn't cut any ice. It makes no difference to me. Uh, as far as the job is concerned, that's outside the job. And um, he said, fine, you know, it's lovely. He shook my hand and so pleased to know and everything like that. And within minutes uh, and during the next course of a few days, all the chaps that had tried to approach me, they all come in with a sort of smirky smiles and sort of say, oh, you know, uh, uh, so pleased to know you're uh, on the square. And I, I said to everybody, it makes no difference. Um, the job will be done as it should be done and it has no bearing uh, uh, and nobody said anything to the contrary but um, it obviously wasn't um, taken on board of what I'd said. Simmons fellow Mason Phil Cuthbert now asked if he could have a quiet word on the square. Simmons guessed this meant Cuthbert wanted to confide his crooked role in the robberies on the Masonic understanding that nothing would be revealed to anyone else. But Simmons was not prepared to treat confidentially any criminal admission. So he went to his meeting with Cuthbert with a concealed tape recorder. They met in a pub in Artillery Passage where Cuthbert talked for three hours about senior detectives and their collusion in the recent robberies. He was also recklessly frank about his own role. I think Phil took Freemasonry in a very serious vein and he believed that as I was a, uh, now an accepted uh, brother that he could talk to me under those lines and um, you know, many uh, Freemasons take the, uh, uh, the craft very, very seriously, like a religion, uh, and that um, it's sacrosanct to them. And I think that he felt that he could talk to me under that vein and that I would not let him down. Simmons' evidence formed the heart of the case against Cuthbert in his 1982 trial for taking up to £80,000 in bribes. He was sentenced to three years in prison. But the man who gave evidence against him now became a Masonic outcast. I went to uh, um, a meeting in the Connaught Rooms, which after all, I'm sure most people know, is virtually the, the headquarters of uh, British Freemasonry. And the chap that I've known for many, many years um, uh, was there. There's a police officer and uh, a Freemason. And uh, 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 we saw, we caught eye across, I suppose, uh, uh, twice the distance I'm sitting from you, and he just stared at me and just shook his head like that, um, run his, uh, his finger across the throat. I thought, gosh, what am I doing here? Um, I need to get out of this place, because um, if one man can do that, I, I need to get out. But what exactly did that gesture mean? Well, it's part of, uh, if one uh, breaches Freemasonry, then uh, you take certain oaths, and one of them is that you'd rather have your throat cut than to um, divulge secrets of uh, Freemasonry. The sign is given by drawing the hand smartly across the throat and dropping it to the side. This is an allusion to the symbolic penalty at one time included in the degree, which implied that as a man of honor, a mason would rather have his throat cut across than improperly disclose the secret. I don't think anybody very seriously believes that these threats will be carried out, but uh, this doesn't detract from the psychological force of it. There's nothing like fear to instill loyalty. But I think even more powerful is the other fact that comes out in, in the ritual, where they say not only will these appalling things happen to you physically, but you will be cast out from us in every other way. In other words, if you betray the Freemasons, you're like the bloke who runs away in wartime, the chap who lets the regiment down, the one who lets the side down, who suddenly becomes the total outsider the strike breaker who's sent to Coventry for 20 years. In other words, they say, we're the most important thing in your life. We never spoke. Uh, that, you know, uh, uh, words and actions, and uh, it wasn't an idle gesture. It was one um, I took in, in the way in which he meant it to begin. John Simmons resigned from his lodge, dismayed at the gap between Freemasonry's high principles and their often shady practice. You agree to be a good man and true, and strictly to obey the moral law. You are to be a peaceable subject and cheerfully to conform to the laws of the country in which you reside. As portrayed in the Freemason's own video, these moral principles are read out to every lodge master at his installation. But apparently too many Masons stray far from the Masonic ideal. Leonard John Gibson is a case in point. In 1979, Gibson was installed as master of the Waterways Lodge which meets at the Southgate Masonic Centre in North London. 
He had reached this rank just seven years after his initiation. But masonry was not Gibson's only interest. At that time, Scotland Yard's flying squad was circulating a confidential handbook of London's top 100 violent thieves, among them worshipful master Len Gibson. On one page was his mugshot, on the next his criminal record, including convictions for handling stolen goods and shop breaking. Gibson's modus operandi, or crime speciality, was shown as armed robbery. Yet there were eight policemen among the brethren of the Waterways Lodge at the time Gibson was master. One of them was former Flying Squad Chief Inspector John Brian McNeil, who declined to talk to us. Perhaps these policemen saw no conflict in being in the same lodge as a convicted criminal. If so, they were not alone in this view, as later events proved. Soon after becoming Worshipful Lodge Master, Gibson pulled off one of Britain's biggest ever robberies, the theft of silver bullion worth four million pounds. Three months later, he was arrested, and in January 1981, at the Old Bailey, he was given a ten-year jail term, as were two other Masons in the gang. So what happens to Masons convicted of serious crime? They should be excluded from the institution completely. As far as being Freemasons are concerned, there should be no road back. That is my personal opinion. They should be excluded from the order and never be taken back. Not all of Freemasonry feels that way, for the silver robbers weren't thrown out. Throughout Gibson's five years in jail, he was listed by the Waterways Lodge as a country member. On his release, the Lodge welcomed him back. And even after newspapers revealed that the robbers were Freemasons, the Brotherhood's ruling body, Grand Lodge, decided they could stay in the craft. Then, six weeks ago, Grand Lodge changed course. At a 90-minute hearing, the robbers were allowed to plead their case in front of hundreds of Freemasonry's high and mighty. Most voted against the criminals, so they were expelled but only after an intense and unprecedented debate. We asked Freemasonry's Grand Secretary what was the argument in favor of the robbers remaining in the Brotherhood? Nothing that uh, really held much water. They felt that they'd repaid their debt to society, um, which I think is probably not quite true. I mean, it's one of those offenses, if you look at the, the law, it's one that can never be spent. Um, they joined their Freemasonry and they felt they got something to contribute to it. And the Grand Lodge felt that they might have something to contribute, but their presence as convicted robbers was an embarrassment. It took nine years for Grand Lodge to discover that armed robbers performing Masonic rituals alongside police was an embarrassment to the Brotherhood. <laughs> 